Okay, we are recording and streaming. All right, thank you. Um, welcome, it's Tuesday, June 2nd. Um, and this is the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee uh, of the Vermont General Assembly. And we are here today to talk with um, advocates in the housing and landlord community, um, as well as the um, as well as legal aid on some of the issues that have been put before us in terms of what we're looking to do for a housing package using the uh, coronavirus relief fund and through the CARES Act. Um, there are some limitations that we're still working against, but the administration has put a proposal forward to spend $42 million on rental assistance and $8 million on um, rehabilitation of apartments that are currently offline. Um, what we'll hear from today specifically is on the $42 million uh, rental assistance um, package. The folks, we heard from Commissioner Hanford several times now over the last couple of weeks. And um, he's mentioned that they are unclear but open to hearing suggestions on how this program would be administered. And this is, and whether it happens through an RFP or is assigned, I suppose, is part of this process. And, um, but the folks from Vermont Legal Aid and um, the Vermont Landlords Association have, have been working together again as they were during S333 on how they envisioned what this program might look like and how it might be uh, functional in as short a time as possible. But I did wanna to start today with Jonathan Bond, who has been in our committee a couple of times over the last couple of years. Um, Jonathan's been uh, the executive director at um, HFI, which is a, uh, they own a number of um, mobile home parks across the state. And they shared a proposal with us. And I just wanted to hear, because we've heard through VHCB, we've heard discussions that mobile home parks should be part of the solution um, moving forward. And I just wanted to hear from Jonathan about what HFI has been thinking about, where they might fit in a, in a package that we're developing. Um, because certainly the package that we're going to be developing on the house side is more than just the $50 million that the administration has put forward um, because we need to address simple housing issues that are not simple at all. So um, with that, Jonathan, um, if you could just give us a couple of minutes of reintroduction and, um, and then just share with us what you're thinking in terms of what your series of mobile home parks can do um, and can be prepared for over the next few months or a couple of years. And we're just trying to hear where this might fit in, um, not just for the next few months, but also for the next couple of years in terms of being more aggressive in terms of finding those, this kind of housing for folks. So um, the microphone is here. So, so folks, once again, I'll do the weekly, um, I'll do the weekly uh, mute all, um, unmute yourself when you, uh, I, I guess when I call on you when, you, when your hands are raised through the participant um, section of the website. So Jonathan, I'm going to unmute you. I think everybody else um, knows it. You can unmute yourself when, again, when you're called upon. So welcome, Jonathan. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, thank you to the chair and to the committee. Um, it's good to see you all again, uh, digitally instead of in person this time. Um, I'm here today to discuss the Housing Foundation's proposal to supply rapid, safe, and cost-effective housing uh, using uh, seven uh, parks that we have throughout the state. Um, and so just to provide a brief intro of uh, what HFI is, uh, our mission at HFI is to, provide, to promote, preserve, and provide quality affordable housing in Vermont um, through developing, owning, operating, and advocating such housing statewide. We accomplish our mission through a broad portfolio of 584 units of apartment style housing at 26 properties. And we are a large mobile home owner with a thousand six lot statewide scattered through 18 parks. Um, and we also achieve a significant amount of our work uh, with partnership through an MOU uh, with the Vermont State Housing Authority um, in order to uh, manage and uh, help develop our portfolio. 
Today, uh, I'm here to provide a proposal of something that we've been working on since the onset of our, our collective lockdown and understanding that HFI has the ability to supply housing in a very rapid environment um, than what we would traditionally be able to if funding was provided. Uh, we could deploy a total of 47 two-bedroom manufactured units into existing vacancies that HFI has at these seven different communities scattered throughout the state. Uh, the inception of this project was originally designed to interface with what we had hoped to be a comprehensive plan of housing and services provided, uh, providing to homeless and housing insecure Vermonters. Uh, AHS and various other departments responsible appear to have gone a different direction uh, with different proposals uh, for the merits that you're, you're considering. Uh, but it does not appear that it would support this type of project that we're proposing. Uh, however, our proposal is capable of standing on its own from a larger plan, is scalable, and if full funding was made available, would produce permanent housing units at a fraction of the cost of traditional apartment-style dwellings, and we would do so quickly. Um, our high-end estimate for this total project would be about $4.8 million for 47 units, and while the initial price tag would be high, uh, this comes in at a per-unit cost of $105,000. Traditional development price tags without any additional subsidies is close to $250,000 to $300,000 per unit. Uh, so $105,000 per unit is significantly less than that. And if our project was supported, there would be, in theory, funding to made available to services and to uh, potential subsidies of those units. Um, also, confident that if this project were to get funded, we could get that per cost. Uh, price down and that overall project would actually be less when we got the full estimates in. Uh, these are based on initial estimates uh, for a proposal. Uh, if less funding becomes available, and I mentioned that the project is uh, significantly scalable, less funding per, uh, would mean less units and the total per unit cost would go up slightly, but our overall fixed costs for this project are extremely low. Um, that's been something we've been focusing on is how we can supply the most uh, housing the safest housing that we can provide uh, at the lowest price uh, and make sure that it's permanent. Um, there are two specific challenges though that we have yet to overcome. The biggest obstacle is obviously the funding. Traditional funding for multifamily rentals is not uh, largely available and would not be quick enough to deploy these units for in a mobile home park. Uh, an example would be for instance, low income housing tax credits or other types of tax credits, which we are ineligible to use in mobile home parks. Funding is one reason why most mobile home parks, specifically those owned by nonprofits and cooperatives, struggle uh, to make it needed improvements in their parks from the problems that have been inher inherited uh, when we purchase them for private owners. Um, that lack of funding stream has me meant that we compete for very limited funding uh, or we have to get very creative through uh, traditional loans and bonding markets, which has their own complications and would slow this project down. Um, uh, this project to be genuinely rapid and cost effective would need funding specifically designated for the project. Um, again, that cost effectiveness comes if an entire project is funded and it would be more expensive on a per unit cost if anything less came in. But it is possible. Um, and uh, the places we have, we have uh, a project where we could eliminate some of the parks that we were planning on filling vacancies in. And that reduction in the number of different sites would have a reduction in the overall fixed cost of the project as well. Our second challenge, though, would be a lack of a specific and an opportunity to provide support services to vulnerable households that we'd be trying to offer these units to serve. Uh, we'd ideally like to see an outside service agency be able to apply for a designated RPF to offer these services. And under this arrangement, uh, HFI would prefer to master lease with a servicing agency, binding both the servicing agency and HFI with the tenant at the same time to directly provide services to those tenants uh, that they need to transition into permanent housing. Um, given the service providers uh, to rent the units, the outlook of the tenants, we believe this would be a successful solution for a transition to new residents into this permanent housing. Long term, HFI would ideally like to transition anyone living in these units or the units themselves into permanently owner occupied units. Uh, mobile home parks are most successful and most stable when they are filled with homeowners that share common infrastructure on rented land. We are only offering this potential option to offer a mobile home as rentals to fill a very specific need tied with some sort of services. And that is really critical for this to be successful. 
Um, and that's the piece that we shouldn't be also servicing while supplying the housing. It should be a separate organization. Um, but like I said, without a comprehensive proposal, um, there would be some challenges. Um, so despite these challenges, you know, we'd be, we'd be looking um, to still fill at a very cost effective and very quick deployment. Uh, we would likely be able to assess, plan, and deploy these units before the end of the year. I would be very skeptical to believe that a similar project with modular homes, non-HUD certified homes, could be as quick as this project. Um, simply because those homes would have to be built in factories uh, as I likely are not already available. Um, and the deployment of modular permanent housing would require additional permitting uh, we to get for an existing mobile home. So that would be something I'd be skeptical with their proposals. Uh, I'd be interested to learn more about. The units we'd be looking to purchase and install would be HUD certified manufacturing homes that are Energy Star rated. Generally speaking, we'd be targeting two bedroom units though we are flexible and could have one or three, up to three bedroom units uh, based on the area and based on the need uh, with the local servicing agencies committed to that. Um, we feel that this proposal would be sufficient to supply the permanent housing and balancing those needs of limited resources uh, and flexibility in the timeline. All seven communities were proposing are scattered throughout the state, and they have at least two units that would be installed at the same time. This plan is a direct acknowledgement that we need to be able to consolidate any housing with services and making sure that there's more than one unit per community that we'd be, uh, we'd be adding to. These small cluster deployments would also have a measurable impact on the existing park residents who are continue to be highly vulnerable, and COVID is no exception. Uh, to that existing social and health uh, vulnerability that they represent, having these new homes in their parks uh, would have measurably positive impacts for the existing residents and surrounding communities. Um, all of the lots we're proposing are currently empty or filled with vacant unsafe homes. Um, so in addition to the stability that they would add, they would also have a significant improvement to the aesthetics of the park uh, as a fringe benefit of, of the project. Um, the project with the majority of grant funding and with limited debt, we could also keep this price of the rental significantly lower than any other traditional apartment. Um, if and when subsidies were to become available, this would provide a better bang for the buck of those subsidies to be able to stretch them farther because the actual cost of the subsidy would be built in um, by having a lower rent, um, given that the, the upfront cost of installing the units uh, could be could be paid for with a majority of forgivable or, or grant funding. So that is a very quick overview um, of what the Housing Foundation can offer to provide very cost-effective, rapid, affordable permanent housing. Um, so I would welcome welcome questions. There's a lot of details we've worked out, and if you there are open questions that I'd love to have a discussion about. Yeah, sure. Very quickly on the seven um, facilities that you're talking about. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, two questions in terms of um, mm -hmm. the 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 locations of those towns or mm -hmm. those parks. Are they near enough to services, or would they require transportation to go along with um, the housing? And and are mobile homes? I mean, you're talking about buying new or relatively new units. Um, are they? constructed in an industrial enough way that they can um, you know put up with the wear and tear of some depending on which which part of the homeless population you house um, may, you know some of the housing may require some more uh, deeper construction than than what I, I don't know what a modern mobile home, looks like in terms of wear and tear. So um, can you just share your thoughts on that? Yes, I, I think uh, given the time horizon we'd be looking at is quickly deploying the housing um, and eventually converting it to permanent long-term housing, it would be able to work with the wear and tear. Over 30 years as a rental, it would not be able to sustain that wear and tear um, in the same way that a traditional stick-built home might be. Uh, that is something that we would be asking the uh, manufacturers and dealers to provide us with the best available products, making sure that we're not cutting corners on things like flooring and uh, how the walls are constructed, for instance. Um, Energy Star rating is not the same as high efficiency uh, modular homes. Um, 
but at the same time still provide a significant amount of savings and uh, we'd be comfortable including in the rent uh, the utilities for part of that that burden isn't being shifted to the renter um, in order to, to quickly deploy. So um, the short answer is, is it would not be the same, um, but given the time horizon that we'd be looking at, we could quickly and affordably deploy them um, and still provide significant savings. Okay, and just about, actually, I'll, I'll go to, um, we have several questions here lined up. Representative Triano. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Uh, you know, just a little bit of a follow-up, you know, as a lister, um, mobile homes depreciate much faster than a stick house as, uh, um, as it was indicated by Jonathan. But um, what we found in Hardwick at Evergreen is that when um, uh, residents were given, uh, given a, a decent place to live, uh, which was um, uh, had manageable costs of, uh, of energy costs and such, that they tend, my experience in, in, in being there uh, campaigning over uh, two different campaigns was that um, people really appreciated uh, being in a, uh, in a uh, residence that um, had, again, uh, energy efficiency and was a, was a decent place. And I noticed that um, the care of the units uh, was um, uh, particularly uh, better than it had been in the past, where uh, there were just a series of really junky mobile homes there. So, you know, it's encouraging to see that in person when we do that. Um, just that's just a comment and a follow up on on wear and tear. They still do uh, bubble homes still do um, experience more wear and tear than a, than uh, a stick house. But um, question is now: Are these lots readily available, uh, Jonathan? Thanks for being here today. It's a it's a good to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to directly answer your question, and then I do want to circle back to the location because that's an important piece yep. regarding the servicing that yep. that uh, Representative Stevens brought up. So. Um, Regarding the fact that these lots are available, five of the lots that we're proposing have an old unsafe mobile home that was built before 1976 that needs to be demolished. And for the committee as a reference point, pre-1976, there were no standards for mobile homes, and thus, and about a fifth of the overall Vermont stock of mobile homes is represented by these non-standardized, unsafe, older homes with poor construction quality. And... Um, we wouldn't be replacing uh, we would we would be replacing those or we'd be filling lots that are currently vacant and had previously had older homes that we've already demolished um, so this is something that we would be deploying immediately um, regarding um, the depreciation i do want to add that depreciation of a mobile home is as much tied to the mobile home park that it is sited in as the home itself uh, for the last 10 years, um, there is a lot of focus on the home, um, whereas the actual underlying infrastructure is a significantly more important piece, making sure it has solid water, sewer, uh, safe roads, and tree removal. Um, and when those conditions are met, you actually will find a mobile home will have some modest appreciation over the life. Uh, in the case of one of our parks in Bolton a few years ago, it was a case where the uh, valuation of those homes uh, not tax purposes, while the rest of the stick built homes in the community depreciated uh, for tax purposes. Uh, so it really is a, is a matter of the park. At HFI, we've committed a significant amount of resources and investment into our parks to make sure that they can hold those values. Um, there are a few parks here which these homes would dramatically improve. Anytime you can get rid of an old, unsafe, non-standardized mobile home and replace it with something, anything really built since 1994, and in this case, we'd be looking at anything built probably between 2006 to a, a right out of the factory home, the, the standards are significantly safer um, than what they, what they were traditionally. And an important piece of citing a mobile home is actually the foundation. In 2016, I made a very specific, very strong uh, requirements around that foundation. The mobile home is properly cited on a foundation. You don't see the same problems that you're probably familiar of when you think of an old uh, dilapidated mobile home. Likely those dilapidated mobile homes are not on a foundation or on some type of pier that's actually failed. Uh, mobile homes that are on proper foundations, even those built before 1976, uh, do remarkably better. And so it's actually more important to make sure the foundation in this project would, would be taking that into account using a new technology with Goliath Piers um, to be able to supply frost-resistant and stable foundations that are adjustable over time uh, to make sure that they maintain their resiliency. 
Um, regarding to the communities that we'd be looking to serve, so in addition to making sure at least two homes would be supplied, most of the communities that we're proposing are on major throughways, um, Route 7, Route 4, uh, very close to highways uh, or close to or have direct access. I will say mobile homes in general uh, are built on the fringe of areas where there are services. So things like public transportation haven't made it to a lot of mobile home parks, which in the future should be something that we have a conversation about because they are dense housing in a rural environment and could be well served by public transportation expansion to be targeting our mobile home communities. Um, but in the case of a few of our parks, uh, Milton, Clarendon, um, uh, Bennington, Hinesburg, the, all of those parks uh, do have, um, are, are on major thoroughfares and are close to both services and public transportation. Um, two parks that would have a little bit more trouble with the public transportation piece is Windy Hill and Weathersfield, but we'd be looking to install up to eight homes. And that would be then working with a good service provider to be able to partner to make up for that lack of transportation by being able to cluster need and the ability to deliver services directly to people home with homes in a row. Um, same would be true for a park in Braintree where we have up 13 lots we could fill uh, that are all generally relatively close to each other to maximize that service delivery. Um, and in Clarendon, it's another 13 homes uh, right outside of Rutland uh, that we'd be able to cluster to cluster that. So we have thought of that service piece. There are going to be challenges, um, but I don't think those challenges are something that we couldn't overcome. And working with a service provider, given that money is available to provide services, um, I think we could target 47 households to be able to, to be successful in a scattered site where they have their own four walls. Uh, they're not sharing walls. They even may have a yard and a driveway themselves. Um, the ability to have more storage uh, for their personal belongings that they may have to keep them safe, um, to reduce um, sort of both the, the actual and perceived vulnerabilities they have. We think uh, these, these sites could be successful locations for that. So just as a, as a quick follow-up, um, your, your cost estimate at 105 uh, K per unit, does that include uh, removal and demolition of homes that are maybe on those sites? It does. It actually also includes a 10% contingency, which we would want to make sure that we're being fiscally responsible and planning for that contingency. But obviously we would love to not have to tap into that contingency as needed. Um, and provide either additional homes or additional savings to the project um, or transfer those funds to servicing agencies to be able to serve, to provide, to provide that, that cost savings. And just, just briefly, um, you know, uh, many zoning uh, laws in, in cities and towns right now uh, require a uh, concrete slab for mobile homes to be put on as a, uh, as a result. So, yeah. and, and again, as what you say, that if they are cited properly, that they that the, the depreciation is considerably uh, lower, but oftentimes uh, siding and the roofing that are used on these units are what deteriorates quickly in a in a situation where you know a family with children may be uh, involved and and such. But so that's a little bit of a concern. But um, as I said, uh, the folks that were placed in Evergreen um, that that rent in Evergreen are, uh, are are taking pretty good care of their units. So that's the awesome optimistic side. Thanks very much for your input. Uh, regarding the foundations, HUD actually has more stringent requirements than any Vermont community or the state. Um, and because the way that Title 10, uh, Chapter 153 is written, uh, the existing lots, we'd be following the HUD standards um, because they're greater than most community standards. And so it, uh, the permitting requirements for this project are significantly less than what they should be for any modular home that's being built because they are just regular permanent housing and should be going through permanent permanent construction permitting in those communities. Great. Thank you, John. Okay. Representative Kalaki, then Walls. Uh, good morning, Jonathan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to make sure I'm understanding. So are you are these brand new mobile homes that you're proposing? Our proposal is to put brand new homes uh, that have been manufactured and not lived in before. Uh, depending on the funding availability and the desire, we could be looking at homes that are new, 
but not right, right from the factory. So that have been built um, within the last 10, 12 years uh, to be installed. Um, and so it would depend on the character of the community and what we'd be targeting to install. But the way we budgeted the project was for new homes to comply with the top standards of both the HUD certified mobile homes, the foundation requirements, uh, and Energy Star requirements. And in the administration proposal, in the rehab model they're proposing, there's $30,000 grants for units. Could that work in the mobile home community that the units existing, which are derelict, could actually be rehabbed to allow people to move in? No, we'd be looking to remove any of the older homes. Um, they're unsafe. Um, and generally older, and we want to be removing that stock. Uh, it doesn't provide any cost savings to fix them up in the short term. Um, we would be paying for that um, for years to come. And so it, you would not get the same savings. So the $30,000. $30,000 would, would, $30, would probably be significantly more than what we would need to fix it up. It'd be better just to put in a new home. Okay, thank you. Representative um, Wells. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, Representative Kalaki just asked one of my questions about the rehabbing, but I, I still have two, and they both have to do with the kind of time frame involved here. Uh, if I understand it correctly, you're mm -hmm. talking about using a, existing lots and existing parks. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering what sort of what the permitting process involved here, especially if it involves a removal and demolition of an existing structure, what kind of time frame is that typically? A new mobile home would be rapidly installed. Um, with the 47 homes, we would be working with the dealers that we'd be looking to contract with um, through a, bit, a, a very fast but still reliable bidding process um, to tell us how quickly they could deploy the units. Originally, when we were conceiving this project, we were conceiving it as more of a holistic plug into a larger plan with both service providers and housers over a 24 month time horizon. Um, and I feel very strongly we could put in all 47 homes within that time horizon. Um, given funding, if funding were to become available uh, or the proposal for us to be able to apply for funding to become available and packaged in such a way that one application would have access to mobile source financing in uh, mid July, with uh, our construction uh, process to start in August, we likely could do a majority of the 47 homes. Uh, we could very quickly eliminate sites to concentrate our sites on those where we have more homes. So for instance, um, in Clarendon, Braintree, Bennington, and Weathersfield, those are all places we have at least seven or more vacant lots that we could prioritize. And we could prioritize our engineering um, and site rehabs to be able to accept the new mobile homes uh, to be in just those parks to, to give us some both time savings and some cost effectiveness um, doing that. We would be partnering with a developer who has said they need a, approximately 10 to 14 weeks total lead time for all 47 lots in all seven communities, but that they could be working in tandem while we could be uh, doing the work for one park um, complete it, install new homes while they're moving on to the next community. And it would be lined up in such a way that we'd be able to, to probably do, um, like I said, a large majority. An actual number of what we could do before December 31st um, would be a harder, harder number to get to, get to you. Um, it would be something that we'd have to do when we actually receive funding and could put, then put out, uh, put out official bids. Well, you just mentioned the reason why I asked, obviously, you know, if we use a, uh, uh, coronavirus relief funds, there is a deadline at the end of the year to have yeah. bills paid. And so that, that was really part, a huge part of my question. And uh, so I, thank you. I think that that takes care of uh, my concern. Thanks a lot. Great. And Jonathan, thank you for coming in. I mean, I do have a um, couple of quick questions. Pad size, 14 by 70 is just ge is generally, um, is that is an older size um, or an older conventional size or does that fit um, what you need? Yeah, so it's actually uh, on the larger side of lots that we have on the mobile. Uh, the 14 by 70 is a standard, standard mobile home, usually between 72 to 72 by uh, 
68. Some of those lots are actually uh, 16 by 80, um, but we were just looking to provide uh, a clear picture of what we could produce quickly by standardizing across the board by at least a 14 by 70. Sure. Um, and that, that was a priority. We do have smaller lots available. We have another 39 lots that we're currently assessing. And we have a separate project that we were already engaged in planning using modular units. So those are, uh, you know, homes built in a factory, but not certified in any way um, and are crane, crane delivered to the site. Um, that's the per unit cost of those smaller homes is significantly higher. And the bedroom count would be something like a one bedroom for a 14 by uh, 40 unit, um, not a standard mobile home. And because the costs are higher, our ability to get those built would take longer. Um, and the installation, we wouldn't be able to do it in the same time horizon. Sure. No, I appreciate that. No, and I appreciate that there you do have some um, significant challenges to to face both financially and from the you know making sure that you know, I mean you guys are not service providers, um, but that you need to be able to develop those relationships. But those are I appreciate you coming in today. Um, and committee, I think Jonathan's proposal talked a lot about other possibilities down the line. This proposal, if I'm not mistaken, the 47 homes was specific, what was started out to be a um, 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 two year proposal. And, um, you know, but again, thank you for sharing that with us. This, this, I see Representative Gonzalez has her name, her hand raised. I wanna um, give her that opportunity. Go ahead, Deanna. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, you just kind of addressed some of what um, I was about to ask about in terms of what you have uh, looked at the different costs and the different variations of options around manufactured homes and, and HUD certified. One of my concerns with mobile homes, particularly in a, like an emergency deployment, as we're essentially doing here, is that mobile homes can uh, have a high toxic load and the off-gassing has historically um, made a lot of people ill, particularly in crisis situations. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, it's, it's concerning to me to just focus on that when the toxic load is, um, is very high. And so I appreciate that you've looked at other manufactured homes and, and looking at, at those different options. And um, my question was really around if there were any additional uh, investigations that you looked at of low toxic homes as, as opposed to these um, the mobile homes that are HUD certified. Yeah. So regarding the, the toxicity, uh, you know, we collectively learned a significant amount of that actually after Katrina, when the EPA deployed uh, a variation on a mobile home uh, that was deployed uh, that had high uh, VOCs, volatile organic compounds and off gassing. Um, that is one reason why we wouldn't probably install anything that was built before 2006. Um, would be to limit that and the modern modern mobile homes are, are using in most cases the similar or same materials uh, that are stick built they're just generally thinner um, and so that would be something of concern of ours um, and something we would be monitoring uh, that said uh, these mobile homes you know are safe and are being purchased on the market uh, with, with other folks who who have been successfully living in them and have not um, at least in Vermont, uh, a new mobile home is not as, as big a concern as it once was. A lot of that is historic um, based on some, some very significant uh, negative experiences, but something that we're uh, we'd be hoping to avoid with a newer unit. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And the toxic load of modern building materials, even the stick belts uh, are pretty significant. And so um, thinking of, of that as, uh, as part of the package that we need to consider. Thank you. Yes, I mean, th these, these homes are an alternative to limited, unsafe, and no housing. Um, Absolutely. And we think that these units can be, with services, uh, the outcomes for the individuals could be significantly higher than uh, at a, a cost-effective measurement uh, way that, than, than all other alternatives could be. Um, Phase two for us is already looking at modular units, 
um, as well as continuing to push federal standards to be strengthened. That shouldn't be something that's oversaw, overlooked because a lot of Vermont laws are based on those manufactured home standards that HUD has set out. And the definitions of what is a mobile home park is based on a manufactured home being installed in the park, not a modular home being installed in the park. And so there's some significant challenges that our state has yet to overcome around those definitions. And so I think there's there's room there. Uh, the addition is for us to be able to buy in essentially large quantities of units. We have more power to to uh, control some of that, uh, some of the materials that are used. Um, and, and there is some customization that we would be using. We would not be purchasing the lowest end mobile home that's currently offered on the mar market. Um, the energy star raising, while from an energy savings perspective is minimal, uh, it still does come with some significant safety improvements. Uh, Great, thank you. All right, again, Jonathan, thank you for your time um, today. And it won't be the last time we see you, that's for sure. Um, no, I, go ahead. I, I appreciate your time today. Um, and I just urge the committee to explore this proposal uh, more. Uh, it will both enhance uh, the existing communities as well as rapid deploy house. Um, so it has a lot of uh, positive externality that uh, we, we didn't even get to discuss. And so um, something I look forward to talking to you more about. Yeah, I mean, and just off the, the last thing I'll say is that what I appreciate is that the, um, and while I'm concerned about how the services might be provided and access to services, um, I do appreciate that this is a focus on some of the smaller communities across the state that um, might get ignored otherwise, um, simply because of their size or their location. And so um, I certainly appreciate HFI's focus on, on in acknowledging that there are homeless people in um, many, many, many towns in the state of Vermont, not just in the, the population centers. Um, so thank you. You're free to stay and listen to uh, this next chunk of time. Um, if you do have uh, six or seven other Zoom calls lined up, you're, you, you may also um, feel free to sign off at your convenience. So thank you for, for coming in at, at pretty short notice. I appreciate that. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, committee, we're going to change gears right away to um, uh, the $42 million rental assistance uh, proposal. And uh, we have with us today, um, Jean Murray from Legal Aid, Wendy Morgan um, from Legal Aid, and Angela Zakowski from, um, uh, from the Vermont Landlords Association. And I would just say, let's just start with, um, I, the way I have it down on the agenda is that with Jean and then Angela, um, and then um, we'll go from we'll go from there. But um, so we'll start with Jean Murray. Welcome back. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me here, Jean Murray from Vermont Legal Aid. Um, we've been working with the Vermont Apartment Owners Association for the last uh, couple of weeks um, in consultation with the Vermont State Housing Authority to try to figure out um, what the program, certain uh, details of what the program for providing rental housing stabilization funds, um, back rent funds for, um, for renters in Vermont. You may recall that we th thought about the availability of these kind of funds back when we were working on the moratorium bill um, and had worked into the uh, calculation of rent escrow amounts when the courts get going again, that we would expect people to apply for rental housing stabilization funds. So we've been thinking about this for quite a long time. So um, I wonder what you want me to do. Um, the proposal is written out and, and because we did put a lot of detail in it, it turns out to be four pages long, but it's in the committee documents um, under, uh, under my name as a witness dated today. Um, and so I could, if you would want me to walk through the proposal um, or I could just uh, hit some. I, I, I think right now, if you could go, if you could give us more of the, um, 
I, I guess more of the twenty thousand foot level rather than the rather than the granular stuff, just to sort of give an idea of, you know, up until now the conversations the conversations we've had that this committee has had during this biennium were pretty limited to the proposal put forward last year that would increase the HOP program that that exists uh, for rental rearages that was. Uh, uh, personified or described as successful um, coming out of the the report that was issued that uh, that VLA that the legal that legal aid issued that I know that Angela participated in that as well is 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 the idea that if 70% of the evictions are are related to back rent um, how can we avoid them and this 42 million dollars is um, addressing a potential need that no one could have anticipated a year and change ago so i'm just kind of curious as to maybe if you can start off the conversation with um really how the how you approached such a such a need or such a potential need as opposed to what we were talking about I mean, just a year ago, we were talking about, well, if we had an extra $900,000 or if we had $900,000 in the rental arrearage fund, we would do wonders. Um, this is clearly the, the need that was drawn up by the Boston Fed. While I think that's uh, probably the, the, the pole star of, of what the problem could be if there's actually 23,000 potential ev um, uh, eviction situations in the state. I, I, don't, I don't know if that number is accurate or not, but it's a scary number um, and that's where $42 million comes in. So I just wanted, if you could, I, I don't know if we need to know the details, uh, the granular details of what you worked out because that's something that, that if there were an RFP that perhaps that would be included in, in the processing. But I am interested in how we would sort of shape this from your perspective and from and from uh, Vermont Landlord Association's perspective to make sure that if we were to put a program in place, it would be in place um, quickly enough to actually help people over the next six months or so, seven months for us. So um, when we we had a, Vermont Legal Aid had an earlier proposal and we thought um, that it sh we should start out by funding it for $50 million. Um, and we had a number of theories that would calculate the need. The Federal Reserve in Boston calculated the need based on who was in um, jobs based that were likely to not have a job, um, and uh, how many how many households were at risk? So how many rental households were at risk? How many homeowner households were at risk? And then showed that for the time being, the first CARES Act funding um, reduced that number, but not didn't eliminate it. So their number for who's who would need help as soon as that extra amount of unemployment insurance runs out is. 8,000 households in Vermont, more than 8,000 households in Vermont. And so one of the things you have to acknowledge is any estimate of how many people are gonna need help and exactly what the dollar amount of help that they're gonna need is an estimate or a guess. Um, and so one of the things about the way we conceived of this program is get it up and running right away, deal with the people who are already behind in rent because the purpose of the program would be to keep everybody from being evicted. Um, that there, when I looked at um, some court statistics, I think there's probably about 600 eviction cases pending right now that have been pending throughout the um, uh, last three months that started before um, March. But as of March, those folks in those households are at risk of eviction. So. This program would um, help people stay in the houses they have, stay in the rental uh, apartments they have, stay in the rental mobile home lots that they have, um, that landlords and tenants would both be able to apply for this program. Because you know, when you think about why did the Federal Reserve in Boston study the problem is if tenants are missing their payments, then landlords are missing their income and then in turn, uh, landlords may not be able to make their payments. This is a huge part of the economy um, that is, is there to supply um, housing for everybody. And if we don't, uh, if we don't think uh, in a big way, we're, we're gonna end up having some failures um, 
tenants are going to be homeless. Landlords are not going to be able to be landlords anymore. Um, so uh, one, one thought that we also had for what this um, back, uh, back rent money could be used for is it could also be used for first, last, and security for people who are currently homeless. Um, and then one of the things we think that folks who are currently homeless could apply for this money for would be um, for some households rent till the end of the year. And believe me, everybody's trying to quantify how many folks might need that. Um, for the current homeless population, a recent inventory that was conducted by looking at people who have done coordinated entry would say that 300 of those households need first, last, and security, and another 400 would need first, last, and security, and then some rent through the end of the year. So um, those would be included um, in this uh, program. Uh, we think there should be, that different tenants are gonna have different needs. Um, they're gonna be in different spots, depending on whether or not they're going to get their job back, whether they're not going to get their whole job back. You mentioned, this is what I'm distracted by, you mentioned that last year, the Housing Opportunities Program that um, aimed at giving back rent to people, it, it, it could be a very successful program, but the population for that program were folks that were at the lowest uh, of income at the 30% AMI. What we're proposing is not going to be limited by uh, the tenant's income. It will be uh, defined by the fact that rent hasn't been paid um, and that, that the landlord agrees that, that rent is owed and the tenant hasn't paid the rent. So to fill in the gaps and pay the rent that hasn't been paid. Um, and, it, and of course it would uh, be available for folks at the lowest um, levels of income also. Um, and I started to say that the idea would be the program would get up and running, and then we would see the, subscrip the subscription levels to it. As I say, everything about the estimate of who needs this help is somewhat of a guess. And so we were thinking that if it's a single program administrator that has the uh, ability to process um, payments quickly, could also give us a report fairly quickly um, we were hoping by August, give us a report of who's applied for the money and what the need seems to be, and then reevaluate the program to see um, whether or not it needs more money or perhaps it needs less money um, because it would be uh, answering the need of people who asked um, for help. So we expect though, with the ex extended or enhanced unemployment benefits that it is not gonna be very long before quite a few people are going to begin to need help because they won't be able to afford to pay the rent anymore. Um, we agree with you that it needs to be uh, quickly enacted um, because that um, reduction in income for a lot of people is right around the corner. Um, so we would, the program that we have would have the, the grounds for termination of tenancy be existing as of March 1st. Um, and that people would be able to reapply. So if they apply and certify that they need the money and that the landlord certifies that he's going to uh, agree not to evict for a certain period of time, um, that if a few months from now, if another occasion arose where the person was behind in rent again, they could apply again, certify again that they need the money. Um, that the Grants would be limited um, to fair market rent. Um, in other words, uh, if, if the landlord has asked uh, the contract rent or the agreed upon rent is greater than the fair market rent in the area, that the grant would only be limited to, to fair market rent and the landlord would need to agree to waive um, any agreed upon rent in excess of fair market rent. That um, the landlord would agree to waive late fees and and not increase the rent. Um, that we hope the program would go quickly and 
decisions would be made within 10 working days and that there would be a certain amount of due process for applications um, that for some reason or another were denied. That, I think I said that. Yeah, so Jean, let me interrupt you right here for a second before I, I have two questions lined up, but um, just to be just to be clear for the committee. So this proposed, the, the proposal from VLA encompasses, and I know there's more detail on the paper, um, but it, it would encompass a certain number of, um, the way it's been presented to us by Commissioner Hanford was a, a further homelessness prevention. Um, exactly. And, and, but VLA, this proposal here is also trying to take some of that money and add a component that's, that would help the currently homeless folks get situated. And we don't have, I don't, I'm not going to ask for a number right this second, but, it, but, but that's what I heard you say is that some of this money should be put aside for first, last and security and a certain number of rental months for some, for some of the homeless folks who would qualify for it. Yeah, that because we understand that some of the people um, who are being housed in motels right now, some of them don't need a lot of help. They just need a boost to get out of the uh, motel and find an apartment. And so uh, it seemed to us as we were saying what this funding should be um, used for that it wouldn't, it doesn't make any sense to leave those people out. And we hadn't seen any other proposals for funding um, to help those people out of motels. So we- in, the, in that transition, in the short-term transition. The short-term, we certainly don't wanna set people up for failure, but one, like for instance, if this program funded somebody to get out of a motel and gave them rent to uh, the end of December, you'd need to sort of flag that person as a homeless person so that when uh, subsidies came up, they would be um, the person who is highest on the preference list for getting uh, subsidies. And simply because they've been housed in an apartment for the last few months didn't take away their homeless status um, because it is somewhat heartbreaking to give people uh, money and then say, okay, it's December 30s, you don't have any more money. Right. Anymore. So to work out things like that. Um, so do, you, do you mind if we go ahead and go to questions for questions for are minutes? great. All Thank right, you. so I'm going to go to Representative um, Hango first, then Triano. Thank you. Um, I'm confused as to the money piece, and I heard you say, you know, that it would be reevaluated. But how can we come up with a proposal if we're not really sure what you're asking for? We're asking for it to be funded sufficiently to supply back rent uh, for people who need it as of the time that they apply. And when it, if 8,000, according to Boston Federal Reserve, if 8,000 people um, need three months worth of rent and rent is $3,000, so you multiply I'm not great at doing math in my head. You yeah. multiply that, and it, it, it comes up to uh, millions of dollars to make sure that people stay housed. Um, I, if you, I could work on um, playing out the math, but any, any um, estimation is just an estimation. We know that it's going to be a big number. We don't know how big. Am I answering your question? If, if we knew uh, prior to coming into this, if we knew exactly um, what all the rents were across the state, um, if we knew all of that, if we knew we just didn't have the information, we don't have the information about of the 18,000 households, for instance, that are paying more than 50% of their income for rent, how many of those 18,000 households were people whose jobs were at risk and have lost income because of COVID-19? In other words, we don't have that correlation that we can um, set out for you with provable numbers, but we can estimate. 
that at least a third of the 18,000 households who are already paying more than 50% of their income for rent, at least a third of them um, are going to need some kind of rental assistance um, because of the shutdown. So I guess you, you don't know, and I don't know how we can put a proposal forward by June 10th if we don't know, and we're not the experts to know. So the money piece aside, I've seen a couple of other figures um, that have been in proposals, one of them 550,000 for legal services to prevent evictions and foreclosures which would be an increase in staffing through the end of the year. Um, and then how does that differ from 150,000 for um, the access to justice coalition proposal? So I'm, I'm like trying to pull numbers out of the air. Hey, thank you for asking that. Um, I've been talking about the 42 million that the governor proposed for rental relief, I think, that might be 50 million. So that's a, a number that is separate from the number that Vermont Legal Aid has requested um, to be funded through September that would have us increase um, staff, temporary staff, seven attorneys and some uh, support staff so that we could cover the whole state. Um, I looked at the pending evictions uh, statistics from the judiciary the other day, if there's nearly 600 cases pending, um, that even to begin to address the ones that are on the court's docket, that's 100 cases per attorney that we're asking for, where we would reach out and contact those people and say, here's a fund, you, you can apply for it, let me help you negotiate with your landlord, let me help you get this done so that those folks are not going to be evicted in the meantime. Also, the plan would be for legal aid attorneys to um, reach out uh, and have no wrong door for people to contact us and say, hey, I'm having a hard time applying. Am I eligible for this? Can I get some rent? Even if I get the rent, the landlord says he's going to kick me out anyway. And that we do things like uh, negotiate with landlords, uh, make sure that paperwork is, is submitted um, and back people up so that they can make the best use of these back rent funds. So that $550,000 would just be from the coronavirus relief fund for the purpose of making sure that nobody gets evicted as long as there's um, rental stabilization funding available. The $150,000 that was already requested by the Access to Justice uh, Foundation was based on pre-COVID uh, considerations for and, and came from the access to justice report which identified a lot of unmet needs in this state it wasn't necessarily specifically for housing as my understanding is the ask included money for additional housing advocacy but it also could be for other kinds of advocacy needed by vermonters um, so that they are able to access the justice system and the and get their cases heard whether it be family cases or debt collection cases or um, housing cases or foreclosure cases. So that was, um, that was the ask prior to COVID. And now we have a housing emergency and the coronavirus relief fund, and hopefully the, there'll be rent stabilization appropriated, and then legal aid could deploy folks fairly quickly to work on making sure that um, Vermonters could access it and uh, not be evicted. Thank you. I guess I'm just seeing a lot of people are reaching for the same money. And that concerns me because there's only that pot of money. So I'm trying to figure out what, um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out what, what asks are out there for that $50 million that's allotted to housing assistance. So that, that cleared up a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Representative Trano. And then um, Representative Trano, Don Walls. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just um, to a clarification question. Now you gave us a figure of 700 individuals that would need 
first last security. Um, I think being 300 uh, would need that and 400 uh, would need extended rental payments through the end of the year. Now, my question is, are those individuals um, part of the 2000 count that are presently housed in motels? Yeah, I, I wanted to, <laughs> those, that's a preliminary inventory. So where I got those numbers was from our advocates that work with the continuum of care and the continuum of care sites have surveyed the folks who, have, who are in motels who have participated in coordinated entry already. Right. And it is, I could be, uh, I think I understood her to say that there were 300 that just needed first, last, and security, and another 400 that would need um, assistance beyond that. But that's really just a preliminary inventory number, but it is more concrete than anything we've had before. Yeah. Okay. That was, uh, and I'm just wondering if that was part of the identified homeless that are currently housed in motels. That's so that, the idea. I mean, that, an estimate is about as good as we can get it right now, right? But, but that's yes. a good picture of what's happening. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you. And I just want to point out that one of the witnesses that we're going to have on Wednesday, on Thursday, is um, someone who's been doing the coordinated entry. It's a coordinated entry is a phrase that I, I, I'm supposed to know, I think, and I think I know what it is. Um, but this is a function that we've heard about throughout the, the last three months where, where coordinated entry into the system for each of these homeless folks has been a focus. And so understanding where there's 300 or 400 um, people, I mean, this is what coordinated entry is supposed to be about, but we're going to get a primer on this on Thursday yeah. from the, some, someone from Capstone is going to make sure that we understand what we're talking about when we talk about coordinated entry. Um, which should help us understand the, the, the broader context of the services needed. Um, Representative Walls. You're, you are unmuted according, no, oh. there you go. Okay. There you go. I am now, thank you. Uh, a, a couple of questions, I think. First of all, uh, thank you for coming in again, Jean. And uh, you mentioned back at the beginning, your remarks, a preference list and I'm not really clear on who's on that list or how people are ranked. Uh, are, for example, people who are currently homeless at the top of that list? Could you clarify that, please? This would be a better um, question for uh, Dick Williams, who I is going to be talking later today. But all housing authorities, um, in order to give out their housing choice vouchers and a couple of mm -hmm variations of housing choice vouchers. Um, what happens is a person applies for it, their application is processed, they're approved, and they're put on a waiting list. And so where you would be on the waiting list, um, if you have a preference, you get higher on the waiting list. Um, and exactly the details of all the different kinds of preferences and vouchers that folks could line up for, it would be better if, um, the Vermont State Housing Authority talked about that. And not just Vermont State Housing Authority has um, wait lists and preferences, but all the different housing authorities around the state do. So that's what I meant by preference, that um, needing a, a, a voucher because of your homeless status, um, I think puts you on a higher preference, but I would appreciate it if you would ask uh, Mr. Williams. Okay, well, thank you. And it would be nice to know that. And then I've got another question. You mentioned uh, need, needing more legal aid staff to negotiate with landlords. And I'm, I'm not really clear on where the negotiations come in. And of course, I don't know what the process is going to look like, but it sounded to me as if it would be a very clear number. So much rent at so much a month is due. And the landlord and the tenant would agree that this is the number. And so I'm just wondering where, what needs to be negotiated? Well, in order for the landlord to receive the money, uh, the landlord would have to agree to drop eviction for a certain period of time. They would have to certify that the um, unit that was being rented didn't have any material defects, or if it did, to repair them within 30 days, um, and to waive rent in excess of FMRs and uh, waive late fees and things like that. 
And sometimes those seem like they might appear to some landlords to be obstacles, um, but to help them understand the limits of those um, and that everything is all good. It, I would think most of those, I would think most of those items would be very clear in the application process when you're applying as a tenant or a landlord, I, I would think whoever's putting together the forms for this, uh, that would all be outlined, you know, that you must do this, you must do that. So again, I'm not really clear where a lot of negotiating, a negotiation is, is needed. I'm anticipating a, a situation where the tenant applies for back rent and then can't get the landlord to fill out the certification paper and says, I, I could, uh, I could prevent eviction, but the landlord's saying no. And so um, talking to the landlord and convincing them to say yes, that getting some money is better than not having money. Yeah. So basically when there's a dispute, that's what you're looking at. Or a, hesita a, a hesitancy to agree. <laughs> nice way of framing it, thank you. <laughs> All right, next up I have Representative Kalaki and then Gonzalez. Uh, good afternoon, Jean. Nice to see you. Uh, when when I uh, when we were talking to Josh Hannaford last week, uh, I said, "So, in your proposal, do, can it include an organization like uh, Legal Aid to help with some of the intricacies?" And he said, "Oh, absolutely. That would be built into the administrative costs." So, could in your proposal, which is, seems very compelling to me, because it's a partnership with uh, Angela's organization. Could it be that the money is housed at BSHA as you propose, and then Vermont Legal Aid is part of the administrative overhead to do this work that's in this proposal? And could all that live within the RFP for the $42 million from the administration? Well, um, I'm not sure that Vermont Legal Aid ought to be a subcontractor of Vermont State Housing Authority. Um, oh, I thought that's what your proposal recommended on page three of four. You recommend that one entity be charged with administering the funds, and you mentioned right. the FHA. So, did I misunderstand? One entity, um, rather than a lot of entities around the state, one statewide entity administering a rent stabilization fund. Um, legal services. Um, we've talked a lot. Or this committee has talked a lot about the social services that yes. clients are going to need. Um, and this would be legal services that clients are going to need or tenants are going to need. And so it's not actually, we weren't thinking of it as part of the um, rent stabilization fund. We were thinking about it as the services that would help the rent stabilization fund be uh, given to people who need it, um, if that makes any sense. It, it would not be okay, I think, for Vermont Legal Aid to be a subcontractor of Vermont State Housing Authority, often because we have um, in the past advocated on behalf of uh, tenants and clients um, what would, as with Vermont State Housing Authority as a decision maker. In other words, we've been adverse to them. Right, right, okay. In the past before. All right, thank you. Representative Gonzalez. Uh, just so that we're all clear, if you can talk about the fair market value um, for the rents and uh, just explain that, that metric, since particularly in the urban areas, we've got um, some very high rents. Right, so fair market rent um, is essentially, HUD establishes it um, by surveying, I don't know how HUD establishes, they establish fair market rent and so, when a person, uh, the, the most familiar use of it is if a person is getting a housing choice voucher, um, they need to go out and find an apartment that is um, fair market rent or below. In other words, it's the, the highest standard that um, a voucher will pay. They are not, fair market rents are different all across the state. In other words, in Chittenden County, they're quite a bit higher. The state um, average fair market rent, I believe Josh Hanford said, is about $984. But in, um, in Chittenden County, 
uh, fair market rent is several hundred dollars higher than that um, for an apartment. So it allows the people who live in that county to, if they get a voucher, to be able to afford to live in the county because rents are higher there. Am I, it's, a, it's a standard, there's a graph. I could find the document and send it to you so you could see what they are across, um, across the state. Yeah, that would be that would be wonderful if you can include that that graph. We've we've seen it in the past, but have it in in a little while. And one of the things for me, the last time I looked at that graph, it was um, out of sync with what the rents are uh, in in Winooski and the rest of Chittenden County. And so then, um, I I really appreciate the way that that your proposal is framing the needs of the landlord, so that it really it seems like a, a really good partnership between landlord needs and tenant needs and meeting the need that uh, of folks um, experiencing homelessness or on the edge of experiencing homelessness and this issue of fair market rent, I'm concerned about because the last time that I looked at the fair market rent, it was out of sync um, with what the actual rents are in Chittenden County. And so if that is a requirement that somebody is living in uh, or that a landlord is asking for fair market rent, in order for a tenant to get the, the access to these funds, then it will exclude people in Chittenden County um, unless HUD has really redone their their numbers in, in uh, a very recent time. So that's that's just a concern that's popped up for me. Um, well, uh, I, I appreciate your question. It gives me an opportunity to say when we were talking um, and coming up with this proposal, rather than using the straight HUD calculated fair market rent, we wanted to use the Vermont State Housing Authority payment standards. Vermont State Housing Authority um, knows uh, the variation in rents across um, the state and that rents in Chittenden County are higher. So in some cases, they, the payment standard that they use is um, higher in Chittenden County than just regular HUD fair market rent in order to help their um, recipients be able to find apartments. And the idea would be instead of to cap um, any of the grants for back rent at three months of the contract rent. So for example, in Chittenden County, a one bedroom apartment might go for $1,700 a month. But fair market rent for a one bedroom apartment, and I'm not gonna say the right number here, but let's say it's about $1,300 a month. Um, rather than cap that at three months rent, say the landlord can get fair market rent, can get the lower number, but may be able to get it for more months than, than just three months at 1700. That's, that was the, our thought that if there was to be a limitation, it should be fair market rent. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Oops. Oops, um, Representative Zahn. Yeah, I, I don't have a question. It was just a quick comment. Um, outside of committee, I've heard um, legislators referring to the governor's uh, economic recovery proposal as if the numbers are fixed. And then I'm concerned because twice, at least twice in the course of this discussion, people have cited the $50 million figure as if that's a non-negotiable, unchangeable figure. And I just want to remind folks that it's not a fixed number, that that number can be changed, and that we should not necessarily accept it as the frame by which we have our discussion today. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it, there's flexibility in all the numbers that are here. The, the, the administration's proposal is a framework that they proposed. Um, thank you. All right. Um, I do want to uh, be conscious of the time. It's already 1222. Um, and I want to move on to Angela Zakowski. And then we still have Richard Williams to hear from before one o'clock. Um, we were going to try to hear from David a little bit, but um, we have him on the schedule for Thursday as well. So, um, so Angela, please join us. Thank you for waiting. Great. Not a problem. Thank you, Chair Stevens and the rest of the members of the committee. For the record, my name is Angela Zykowski. I'm the director of the Vermont Landlords Association. 
Uh, we are a uh, for landlords. And we've been working with Vermont Legal Aid uh, through this process, not only on uh, S333, but now also on this recovery package. Um, we've put forward what I think is a pretty comprehensive look at a program or request for a program. And what we've tried to do is balance, um, balance the needs that we're all sort of using our best guesses as what is what the need is out there, balancing that with the goal of keeping people housed, um, trying to put forth a system or a process that is as simple as possible for people to access. Um, and that goes with one of the recommendations with having this program housed with one agency and within one entity um, where you know various organizations like mine like legal aid like the various capstone can know to go like this is where we go to access these funds um, i think our thoughts were we have these five groups that we've identified and the goal wasn't to allocate certain amounts of money to each of those groups, but to identify those were groups that could participate and apply in for funds. Um, with the uh, rent issue for the Vermont State Housing Payment Standards, again, we're trying to find that balance, um, understanding that rents aren't the same around the state. In some areas, they are much higher than others. And to try to provide help to as many households as possible um, without any one sort of area or group having some sort of windfall, windfall here. Um, the other thing is that is looking for a program that can be very quickly enacted and get up off the ground. Um, that's part of the reason for recommending uh, Vermont State Housing Authority as the potential provider here. Um, they have the infrastructure, um, they have the systems in place they're used to doing direct deposit payments. They're used to dealing with tenants. They're used to dealing with landlords. Um, they have the ability for a lot of administrative um, functions such as sending 1099s at the end of the year for monies that have been paid out or um, providing tracking for the legislature uh, of how these funds are being used. Um, so we would ask, or my organization would ask for the, for the funding of the $42 million for this program. Um, and as we build into our request, there will be opportunities for reporting back. Are we using, is this program using more money? Is it using less money than we anticipated? And some of it can be reallocated somewhere else. Um, so we've provided these discrete points in which the program can be looked at again as we collect more data and understand better what the need is. And, and the need, regardless of what the need is, we're talking about the need over as the cash, as the money, as the CRF stands now, we're talking about a problem that exists between now and December 30th. I mean, that's really, that's really kind of the, that's what I hear from, from you is like, if we can keep it to one agency for these next seven months, that that would facilitate this whole process. In, in your opinion, in the way that you guys have worked together. Correct, correct. I mean, right now we have, we know there's 600 evictions that could access and utilize this money. We know there's another two to 300 households of the homeless population that could use this money to get into more permanent housing. And we also know that the federal supplement on the unemployment is going to expire at the end of July. So come August 1st and perhaps September 1st, we are going to see a new batch of need uh, of folks who maybe previously haven't had issues with rent. So the this, this 600 number, are, is that you say you know that there's 600 evictions that are in process that are currently stayed now under S333? Is that, is that, is that an accurate statement? That, that sounds accurate. I mean, Jean indicated she had looked at the judiciary and had received that number from the judiciary. I don't have a reason to think that it's not accurate. Sure, but that's just, I mean, it's just a good piece of information for us to, to know. Um, 
So again, Angela, I so totally appreciate you working together on this issue and under, and really making this very difficult conversation a lot easier um, by working in tandem. And the same goes to Vermont Legal Aid and to to view this problem as a as a problem that we need to address together um, or as a unit because it's too easy to just put landlords and tenants in separate camps and they often are and some and they often need to be but this has been um, to, to witness again the, the, the working together on this is um, I, I can't really tell you how how um, good it feels no matter the problems we're going to foresee or that we don't foresee yet or that we're going to experience um, just to get to this point together I appreciate it I just really want to make sure that that you know that that it is appreciated um, in quite a change from what we experienced 10, 12 years ago, or just what people think that happens between landlords and tenants, and, and quite frankly, does happen at times. But this is to have to have you working together with with um, the other VLA on this is really important. Thank you. I I have said for a number of years that the interests of landlords and tenants are not opposed, nor should they be opposed. This is a symbiotic relationship between these two parties. And the more we can um, promote uh, communication and coordination and cooperation, I think the better off the entire uh, community will be. Um, does our relationship break down? Yes. Um, do myself and legal aid agree on everything? No. Um, but there is a need here for us to be cooperative and work together um, given all of the circumstances and the situation. Thank you. Any further questions for Angela right now? I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Um, Thank you. So for please, me. yeah, please feel free to hang out. We have Richard Williams on deck now, and um, and I and I guess just to address some of the conversation, I want to make clear that you know, I think I asked Richard to come on not as a not as a um, well, for his experience in what it is like to issue rental assistance and to deal with these these problems, I, I think given the fact that we've all talked about the fact that there will be an RFP, and while there's a desire to have one organization and that organization may be the State Housing Authority, that is not written in stone. Um, but I think that, Richard, I, I wanted to bring you on to get your feedback on what you've heard and also what you've heard over the last couple of weeks in terms of this program and what it's going to take in order to make it work for um, landlords and tenants. Um, and, you know, how does this fit within, um, I mean, I, the one question I had was, how does this fit in with any potential voucher program? I mean, it sounds like this is, the VLA proposal is, is not only just a, a homelessness prevention, upstream prevention, but also trying to make sure that there's money available at least through the end of this year. So I just, I'll pass the microphone to you and that's a lot to, that's a lot to bounce around, but um, here we are. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Stevens uh, and committee members. Uh, it's always a pleasure to address you folks uh, and uh, certainly uh, we are in a different world right now. And uh, um, so, yes, uh, I just want to give you a little background as to who Vermont State Housing Authority is. Uh, I'm the executive director of Vermont State Housing Authority, and I have been with the agency for uh, 46 years. So uh, as far as accountability goes, we are a quasi-state agency. Uh, our Board of Commissioners, which is seven commissioners, are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. Uh, we do not receive any state uh, appropriations to run our programs. Our programs are all federally uh, funded. However, we do administer some programs for the state of Vermont. Uh, we, um, we do uh, do inspections for the uh, Vermont Rental Subsidy Program and for the some of the hop uh, hop units uh, through the agency of human services there's about a million dollars that's appropriated through department of mental health uh we're assisting currently 116 individuals in that what they call healthy subsidy plus care program 
uh, with uh, another 16 folks uh, searching for housing at this time. So um, we do not administer the Vermont rental subsidy program directly. That is something that is done through the Agency of Human Services. Vermont State Housing Authority has a re relationship with uh, more than 1,697 landlords in the state of Vermont. And we make more than, uh, we make, we exceed uh, $50 million a year in what we call housing assistance payments, uh, which is the uh, subsidy amount uh, that we pay directly to the landlord. Uh, we make those payments on the first business day of the month. Uh, and we have in place systems and processes that allow us uh, to uh, make those payments uh, with short lead times. Uh, and we know how sensitive it is for you know, folks to access housing. So our programs are flexible. So if that means mid month, the check has to be cut you know, to get someone into housing because a landlord maybe in Chittenden County is not willing to wait you know, because they have people standing in line wanting that housing. Uh, we're flexible. Uh, we can get those payments out. And, uh, and, we, and our target group, obviously, are very low-income fa families uh, and individuals that are at 30% or less of, of income. Um, so I, I heard a lot of questions uh, today that was proposed, and, and, uh, and I can probably answer some of those. Uh, this, this particular program we're talking about, uh, we have an interest. Uh, we know that, uh, and, uh, that there will probably be competition for this money uh, through some type of public process through a, you know, an RFP process or NOFA notice of funding availability, um, uh, depending on you know, what the rules of the game are, I guess, uh, is that we would be interested in probably applying for those funds. Uh, we, uh, my concern has been all, all along is that we're a little behind uh, what some other states are doing. And uh, some, some other states have already stood up their programs. And you know, as in Vermont, it's a different process. Uh, uh, I'm not into all the details, but my understanding the governor you know, has, spent, has spent probably about half of this uh, $1.25 billion and the other half, you folks are gonna decide on how, how that money gets spent here in the state. Other states, uh, a governor has had total control over that. So they have stood up their programs and they're already up in place and running. There's uh, a lot of good examples out there of how not to stand up a program, I think, uh, because some are so restrictive uh, that I just see it would take a, you know, it would, we wouldn't be, would not be able to get the money out quickly. Uh, in some states, uh, Arizona one was one that I was looking at. Uh, they require uh, some type of photo ID. Uh, they require, you know, bank statements prior to COVID-19, uh, uh, current bank statements. Um, you know, I, I think that is, is pretty restrictive. I think the uh, programs that Legal Aid has uh, in the apartment owners association is proposing is, is, uh, is much more flexible. Uh, but it does have a cap, as, uh, as Gene mentioned, uh, uh, his proposal would be to use what we call Vermont State Housing Authority voucher payment standards. And I think to answer some of the questions I had heard that uh, concerns that those rents may not be sufficient enough, um, they are not at market rate. Uh, they are based on 40% of the medium income. HUD uh, is, uh, establishes that as a, uh, the, uh, the level of funding that it, it does under the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Uh, but housing authorities have the ability to exceed what we call fair market rents. Uh, we have some authority to go above that. So for example, uh, Burlington was mentioned uh, for a one bedroom apartment in Burlington, uh, under our standards, we're able to pay $1,134 as compared to say Washington County, which is $911. So you can see the difference there uh, that is recognized uh, between the two areas. The, uh, we're currently, uh, you know, assisting uh, you know, over, you know, 4,000 uh, uh, low-income households with the Housing Choice Voucher Program. Vermont State Housing Authority actually operates the program uh, uh, statewide. 
Uh, there is a reference to local public housing authorities there, of which there are eight. And those are located in, in more of the larger uh, cities or towns here in Vermont. Those are local, uh, they have their own, uh, they're considered municipalities uh, and as a, uh, therefore their commissioners are appointed through their local government. Um, but they run separate, uh, you know, autonomous programs. Uh, we have no oversight over local housing authorities. Um, you heard some questions about preferences. Um, they establish their own preferences based on what their need of, of their community is. So, to answer a question is, uh, you know, the, the use of some of the funds for, uh, you know, helping uh, folks in, in motels transition uh, out of the motels. Um, we're we're still waiting to actually see a plan to come out of agency human services, how, how they're planning on dealing with it. But what is what is starting to happen now, which is uh, is concerning to me, is that we're starting to get uh, calls directly from folks in motels, homeless folks in motels, you know, contacting uh, my agency frantically, saying we need to be out of the hotel in a week or two. Uh, can you help us out? Can you help, uh, you know, can you provide us, you know, housing? Uh, that's not how I thought this was going to work. Uh, and uh, so I'm hoping that uh, those, uh, those issues can be uh, maybe changed because I, I, I think we really do need some type of navigator to help folks uh, transition out of motels. And I don't think it, that the proper way to do that is having them call the agency and applying directly. I think my understanding, we talked about the coordinated entry. You're going to get some more information about that later this week. But, you know, my understanding, everybody had a name uh, that was homeless and we knew where they were. And that's probably the first time that's ever happened in the history of uh, the homeless population is that we know where folks are. We know who they are. Uh, and uh, as many have already said that, you know, this is the first time that we have temporarily ended homelessness in the state of Vermont. And that's something we should be very proud of. And, and my, uh, you know, accolades to the, uh, to the, to the governor and, and to uh, agency of human services for, for doing that. And uh, without a lot of pressure, uh, I mean, I, they stepped up and, uh, and we took folks out of congregate facilities and, or we took them off the street or, or out of the encampments and provided a roof over their head, which is a great thing uh, for us to do. Now, now we have an opportunity to start transitioning those folks back. Uh, we do have a preference for homeless. Uh, our, our housing choice voucher wait list is closed, uh, but we will be opening it to, uh, to start receiving applications from folks in motels. Um, and uh, what's available is what we call turnover vouchers. Uh, we turn over you know, anywhere from 35 to 50 vouchers a month in the past. Uh, and with a preference, uh, they go to the top of the wait list. Uh, some people say maybe that's not fair to other, uh, other folks that are just low income, uh, could be working or, uh, uh, but uh, don't have a preference, those people stay on the wait list longer. So we, we do make choices and uh, the choice is to really to help the most needy. Uh, so those folks would be uh, uh, be on a wait list and as a voucher comes up, uh, they could be issued the voucher. Uh, the thoughts behind the uh, first month, last month uh, and security deposit that uh, Vermont Legal Aid and the Apartment Owners Inc. has put forward um, could also access people to other housing units that already have subsidy in place that already have project-based uh, vouchers. Uh, if they had had access to this money, this would be uh, available to them that would allow them to access these units. Um, but the one thing I think we need to not forget is that, uh, you know, many of these folks will need services. Um, I sometimes have heard testimony that maybe a third of them would need, uh, you know, continuous types of support. Another third might need, uh, you know, support, you know, for 12 to 18 months and maybe others uh, would need short-term support, you know, for, for 12 months or, or whatever. But, 
you know, a roof, over, uh, a roof over the head, obviously, if you're homeless is very important, but also we want to, I'm very cautious about setting people up for failure. And so I just want to make sure that there is coordinated um, support services. Uh, you know, you've heard testimony in the past. Uh, we, we keep using the three-legged stool. Uh, you know, rental subsidies, obviously very important here. Uh, it allows people to get access uh, to the housing units. But the service portion of it, you know, will keep them in the housing. Uh, that's the last thing we need to do is keep turning people's lives over. And uh, especially uh, for anyone, but especially for households with, with children, uh, that, that's probably the worst thing that we can do. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, the, the idea behind the, the, uh, the $42 million is, is that uh, you know, we know what the, the homeless population is right now, and we want to prevent anybody further, you know, becoming homeless because of, you know, loss of income uh, or uh, other COVID-19 reasons. Uh, and uh, the rent stabilization type program uh, is, uh, although we don't know how many people will be applying, quite frankly. So, you know, if it's, you know, uh, Commissioner Hanford, uh, you know, suggested maybe 13,000, 13,500. Uh, you know, if that's, if you use a thousand dollars a month or whatever, for three months, you know, that's 40,000, uh, 40 million, 500,000 dollars. Um, Jean's uh, 8,000 is $24 million. So that's, that's sort of the gambit. Uh, but the idea behind, you know, some of our conversations is that, you know, there could be you know, uh, reporting to the legislature and the administration uh, at some appropriate time on, on the, what is being spent and, uh, you know, adjustments could be made, uh, you know, before 1230 of uh, 2020, so. so Richard, um, a question on the vouchers and the project-based vouchers versus the others, the, the, the individual vouchers. Do you know, we can we use the Vermont state vouchers as project based? I mean, project based vouchers are stable for they're stable for obviously the landlords because it's it's based on it would be based on the unit itself and not necessarily the individual tenant. And it may lessen some of the workload or the paperwork on behalf of the tenant. But is do, have we ever used the Vermont State Voucher Program for project based? And and are there any other vouchers that you are aware of that are coming from the federal government through any kind of CRF money, either project based or individual? Um, because it's obviously the more that comes from the federal government, the less it is for us ongoing. So I answer your first question, uh, Vermont Rental Subsidy Program has never been used to, to, to my knowledge uh, in a uh, project-based subsidy uh, um, unit. Uh, I think the concern over that has been uh, committing funds uh, forward uh, through their appropriations. Uh, so the project-based vouchers, if, if we can, we have the opportunity to uh, make a project based voucher which is unit specific and that the term can be uh, uh, can be anywhere from five years to 20 years uh, we have provided project-based vouchers federal project-based vouchers to many of the uh, uh, new low-income housing tax credit uh, projects that have been developed around the state either through nonprofits or for profits uh, that helps, uh, that helps that tax credit project attract uh, capital dollars uh, to the project. And, uh, you, know, you know, basically guarantees that someone that's gonna be income eligible will be in that unit. And that's, you know, uh, and that's uh, one of the requirements obviously that of the low income housing tax credit program is that people under certain income be housed and uh, sometimes without that subsidy it is difficult in certain areas of Vermont to attract someone that kind of fits in the mold of having just the right amount of income to, you know, uh, without any uh, public supports to be able to afford the rent uh, in a tax credit project. As far as the, uh, 
the only uh, um, you know we have uh, just received uh, you know it's just a small number it's 24 units of what they call mainstream housing um, and that's for uh, an individual uh, or or a member of the of household that uh, is under the age of 62 and has some type of disability so we just received 24 of those and that was based that was a, you know based upon the, the current uh, uh, coronavirus uh, uh, relief fund under the cares act that, that came through uh, on top of that we have uh, were awarded and um, and competed for uh, another 50 so we have about 74 units that we want to try to target uh, to the uh, to the homeless population coming out of the motels. Uh, as far as the uh, future funding uh, uh, in the CARES Act, you know, we received funding, uh, public housing authorities received funding, you know, uh, in anticipation that people were losing uh, losing jobs uh, and loss of revenue. And what that allowed us to do is to adjust the portion of the amount of money that uh, is being subsidized to the landlord. So basically, you know, more money to the landlord because of less income to the tenant, you know, so their rent goes down and the portion to the payment that's being made to the private landlord goes up. Uh, there are monies built into that. We are, you know, currently working with our congressional folks to uh, all the con our congressional staff is to uh, the, there's a uh, there's a shortage of actual uh, funding to support the full number of vouchers uh, that are allocated uh, to my agency or to other local public housing authorities. Uh, for example, uh, it's based on budget. So as appropriations get cut in Washington and as locally fair market rents go up, uh, we're given a certain amount of dollars and we have to manage, you know, our, the, 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 uh, the number of units with that amount of money that we're given. So we may be allocated 4,200 units under the Housing Choice Voucher Program, but we can only uh, support about 3,700 of those. So there's about 500 units, what we call on the shelf that we can't use because we don't have the funding to support that. So we're working on our congressional delegation to try to get some language put into either the uh, 2021 uh, appropriation bill or in, in a bill that may be working its way uh, through Congress. As you know, the, uh, the House uh, probably a couple of weeks ago passed a bill called the HEROES Act. Uh, that would fund additional vouchers. Uh, it may be temporary, it might be only for two years, whatever, there's significant amount of money in there that could be, uh, that would, uh, and what that portion would be coming to Vermont, I couldn't tell you what that is, but I'm sure there's a formula or someplace, and, you know, it's, it's sort of like the coronavirus relief fund, you know, you know uh, certain states got, you know, the $1.25 billion, so there would be some type of allocation, but Generally, what that would mean is more vouchers coming into Vermont, uh, and we could help more people. And uh, but uh, right now, the uh, leadership in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, is you know is you know making overtures that that bill is dead on arrival, uh, and they don't intend to take that bill up. Uh, they may pass their own bill uh, at some point in time, but they want to see how the the first rounds of money are being spent. Uh, uh, but we're looking at maybe late July or August at the earliest before that, before the Senate could possibly take up a bill. So I don't know if that answered all your questions. But oh, have... Richard, yes, unfortunately, um, in some ways. Uh, Representative Kalaki, and I just want to be um, conscious of the time, it's 12.51 on my computer. Um, and I do have a couple of notes just before we go. Um, so go ahead, John. Uh, Richard, thank you for coming back. Uh, I'm, I, I wanna make sure I understand, uh, is your agency going to apply to the RFP to the administration for this $42 million if that's the number? Yes, yes, we plan to a, a plan. Uh, to and will you be applying with the proposal that Jean and Angela brought forward today? Uh, we certainly, uh, uh, 
I, I think we'd probably be looking to see what ACCD puts forth. And, you know, as an RFP or a NOFA, and we would be responding, uh, you okay. know, to that, to that specific NOFA. And in your proposal, you, you talked about that supportive services are essential. Would you add that into your RFP proposal? Uh, I don't think uh, that there's uh, adequate funds probably to do that. I, I think that uh, we need to hear from Agency of Human Services as to what, what their plan is to spend their, the, their, uh, uh, the monies that they will be receiving and how they plan on uh, supporting services to these, these families. But we would definitely be working you know, and coordinating with these uh, entities as well. But you feel that that would need significant additional dollars. Yeah, I think we've testified uh, in the past as well as, you know, other uh, service providers, you know, that, that there's inadequate monies uh, currently to, to fund the services uh, that are needed for the homeless. Uh, so I, I think basically what I'm trying to echo here is that we can't forget that we need to, to make sure that we have uh, adequate uh, services to, to keep these folks housed and, and uh, to make sure there's some type of transition you know, into permanent housing and, and uh, we don't want to be going through another eviction because um, the support system's not there. But could you then apply and say you actually need $65 million to do this or whatever the number would be that would be the right number? Well, I have, like I said, I'm, I'm not a, an authority on this uh, representative, but my understanding is that, you know, and I thought that uh, the Commissioner uh, Hanford had testified on this too, is that uh, I think uh, an, initially that uh, there was hope that both ACCD and, and Agency of Human Services were going to come out with their housing proposals uh, at the same, roughly around the same time. Right. Um, so uh, I, you know, they ACCD put out this portion of that. Um, so we're still waiting to see what is going to come out of Human Services. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that. I appreciate I'm it. Sure if, I'm not sure I answered your question. No, you did. Absolutely. Was, so. Thank you. It's days like today that I miss being in person um, and well, having get, a little bit know, more time. You get to see my long beard. <laughs> I have hesitating making any mention of your long beard. Um, I want to take a minute. I got a request from Wendy to make a response on, on um, she had an answer, different answer for Tommy, um, for Representative Walls on on the role that VLA would be playing, that legal aid would be playing. Um, Wendy, I can you unmute yourself? There you go. Hi, Wendy Morgan from Vermont Legal Aid. Thank you. I. I just want to say, first of all, thank you for taking this up and, and hearing that June 10th at noon is a, a hard deadline. I makes my heart beat a little faster and I'm sure it does for you too. Um, and, I, and I think the, uh, the comments about, first of all, that it has to be flexible um, and that you, you all are gonna to have to look at what you think is the right amount of money to do any of the things that you wanna have done. I mean, obviously there's a lot of different requests for housing related money um, to come in, including actual physical housing, like Jonathan was talking about and um, the registry that you've heard about and legal aid is another and whether or not it's specifically in the administration chunk of what the ad administration put forward with the 42 million or not. Um, I think that Jean is right that our request would be a separate request, but I wanted to explain a little bit more, not that it's different, but a little bit more about how, why that money might be useful because we would totally support having as many cases get resolved before going to court as possible. And part of our proposal for um, 550,000 was to cover pre-filing cases and to assist people getting into the system. But even if none of that is needed, there are already 600 cases approximately right now um, that need settlement. And we know from the report that Legal Aid did a year and a half ago that having a uh, representation for the tenants as well as the landlord helps move cases um, 
forward and to a good resolution, either that the person stays and there's a good uh, relationship between the landlord and tenant and that's been um, rejuvenated, let's say, or that um, the person is going to move and there's going to be a, a smoother transition. So I just, I wanted to um, point that out. So that was, that was for my comments for today. Thank you very much for your time and thought about all of these housing issues in the coronavirus fund. Great, thank you, Wendy. Um, and just wrapping up, um, I got a text earlier through the meeting from uh, leadership asking us to re to move our schedule on Friday from 12 to two, um, from 12 to two to one to three, just like we did this past week. There is enough on the floor apparently that will um, take us to one o'clock on on Friday. And rather than us um, sitting here waiting and tapping our fingers and waiting for the floor action to close, I appreciate leadership reaching out and asking us to just go ahead and shift us to one to three on Friday. Um, so that's it for today. Um, again, we will on Thursday, we will, uh, we will meet from 1030 to 1230. We will hear from a, a representative from Capstone Community Action on what the coordinated entry system really is and how it works and how it's working um, during this crisis and what the intent is. Um, and we're also, I also invited Mary Moulton in from Washington County Mental Health. We had Mary in recently and I've asked her to come in to describe the services that people receive, um, especially in, in keeping them in their home, whether they were homeless or not, but specifically if they're homeless, what service, what are we talk? what are we talking about when we're talking about services? And I don't want us to forget that this is an incredibly difficult population to provide services to um, and how necessary. And we've heard just from just now from Richard, just as the third leg of the stool of what they mean to keeping people in a stable housing environment. And so I just wanted us to get a primer on that again, a reminder of what services we're talking about rather than at this point in the year when we tend to go, oh, it's just services, it's just services. Um, it's a reminder of, of, of what they'll be. Um, Representative Triana. Uh, yes, I, I, one of the um, uh, the pieces that you had sent out to us did have uh, somewhat of a breakdown as to what services and who would be uh, in need or eligible for them. So, um, and that's that's a Central Vermont. Um, yeah, right. That's a Central Vermont response and I which I thought was very thoughtful but again it's a central it's a one county response um, and I think Mary can talk about that she participated in that conversation and I'm sure that the um, the needs are statewide but um, but you're right I, that's kind of what that, that's kind of what inspired me to just invite her in to describe what the services are so that's a good idea it was um very wordy for one county, but um, the other thing, I, only other thing I wanted to mention in closing was that, uh, you know, uh, I like Jonathan's plan. I think that the, um, the expeditious na nature of it was um, was encouraging, but I am disturbed that, um, you know, we looked last week and found that Caledonia County, for instance, um, to look into my area and, and into the Northeast Kingdom is, uh, has a higher or disproportionate number of uh, family with children uh, in their homeless population. We have no shelters um, and we do see um, an opportunity to have some uh, mobile homes uh, put into place in Hardwick um, for a little bit more cost than he was talking about, but uh, five, uh, five units that could house five families um, and yep. again, in, a, in, a, in a, an expeditious fashion that um, I would have to put my uh, two cents in for. <laughs> well, and that may end up being part of what, if there's, again, an agency like VHCB has been talking about having, you know, putting, requesting 20 plus million dollars out of the CRF funds for capital purposes. Um, you know, maybe these folks are participating in part of that, um, 
processed as a as if it were a housing bond again where they're where the money's available and they're requesting it but again let's we'll pick up that conversation okay. the yeah. next time we speak okay. thanks Tom. thank you everybody um yeah. we will see you next time and or well well what maybe we'll see you this afternoon right there's yeah, a caucus this afternoon so okay. um thanks for this work today and we'll be in touch And Ron, I'll catch up with you.